nation in the midst of a global health pandemic, a racial pandemic, and many scholars would argue an economic crisis. Citizens are struggling to stay healthy. Many remain vigilant through the pain and loss of loved ones, loss of jobs and economic stability, and the loss of faith in a society whose integrity was once taken for granted. And we are the leaders whose task is to guide them through. We have convened this afternoon to, this, to discuss the scope and capacity of our leadership in complex times, who and how will we support our citizens in society through this transition. Again, I welcome you. I am Layla dunbar Keys, Adjunct Assistant Professor of Sociology at Community College of Philadelphia, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. Let's begin. Our participants this afternoon are Diana Medley, Regional Director of the Philadelphia Regional Office, Lyle Wood, Regional Direct Director of the Pittsburgh Regional Office, Heather Roth, Regional Director of the Harrisburg Regional Office, Adrian Garcia, Director of Fair Housing, and Gurlaine LaRue, Director of Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs. Again, thank you all for being here. We're going to begin this afternoon with Lyle Wood. Good, good afternoon, Mr. Wood, and welcome. Please, mute, please unmute yourself. There you go. Good afternoon, Professor Keyes. I hope you're doing well. Oh, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate that. I wanted to ask, how long have you been at the P Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission and in what capacity? Okay. Uh, I've been uh, fortunate enough to have been with the uh, Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission since January 19th of 1989, about 31 years. Um, I started out uh, uh, January 19th, uh, 1989 as an investigator, uh, and from there, uh, probably until uh, 2013, uh, when I became a supervisor uh, for the uh, compliance uh, and the uh, housing uh, units, uh, and then I've been regional director since uh, probably July of, of, of 2016. I've been there a few years. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Garcia? You most recently joined the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, and you joined during the global pandemic, the COVID-19 <laughs> coronavirus crisis, along with the civil protest. How have you been able to get professionally acu acu accumulated, I'm sorry, um, during these challenging times? It, it is difficult. You know, when, when, you, when you're in a transition like that, you have to prepare uh, for leaving and arriving at the same time. So as soon as I found out that I was going to be uh, making that move and be blessed with this opportunity, uh, I first spoke to, to my successor and we immediately started a succession plan. And then uh, once that was done, then it was about doing my homework, doing some research on the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act just to kind of get, get my brain functioning in, in those terms meeting with all of the uh, directors, the regional directors uh, and chief uh, legal counsel as well, once I uh, made the progress over um, and meeting with the housing team to kind of get up to speed and, and get a, a sense for how we're gonna work together and build that, that cohesiveness. So it has been challenging, but I try to keep a positive attitude uh, and always look at the horizon. So think of things in terms of how, how, how they may appear and then what I can do to make things flow a little easier. So in challenging times, you just have to have that adaptability. And yes. um, so far, so good. Let's just put it that way. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And Miss Diana Medley, good afternoon. How are you? Good are you with afternoon. Us? Hi, how are you? How long have you been I'm with the PHRC and in what capacity? Yes, um, I've been with PHRC for 22 years. I um, started on July the 21st of 1998, so I just celebrated 22 years with um, PHRC. I started as an investigator. 
um, I was then um, promoted to a supervisor who are, they're now known as team leaders and now regional director. I've been the regional director since February 4th of 2017. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And Ms. Heather Roth, welcome and good afternoon, Ms. Roth. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thank you very much. How long have you been with PHRC and in what capacity? Um, I started with PHRC in 2013, so I'm going on almost eight years. Um, I was fortunate enough to start as the regional director for the Harrisburg area, and I've been in that position the whole time. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And Gurlaine LaRue, am I pronouncing your name properly, ma'am? Of course not. Oh, please, please, please correct me. <laughs> Oh, it's Gerlene Leroy. It's very common that people get it wrong. So. Gerlene Leroy. Oh, very good. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> so, How long have you been with PHRC? Well, I've been working at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission for more than a year now. Um, I was initially hired as the Director of Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs, as you mentioned in your introduction. In that position, I'm responsible for drafting policies uh, designed to provide guidance, uh, sometimes regarding issues that are not fully covered under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. And uh, since December, I started working in the mediation program where I, become the, the, where I became the director of the mediation program. Uh, I supervised the mediator and that program uh, was dormant for six years. So we were very excited to revive it. Uh, it had to be revamped from the ground up, ground up, but we've been very successful. So far, we've already um, made settlements in the amount of $285,000. Wow. So it's been a very successful program. It sounds like it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And also, since I have you already, what has been the most challenging aspect of leading during the COVID-19 pandemic and also the civil unrest? And how have you dealt with these challenges? Well, as far as leading during the pandemic, uh, the most challenging, uh, especially at the beginning, was to ensure that we were still productive while working from home. Uh, that challenge was even more difficult for my team because we only had been working as a team for about three months. So the way I dealt with that challenge was by setting daily and weekly production goals that were quantitative in nature. And I also provided my team with an explanation and demonstration of uh, how their productivity would be evaluated and I provided consistent feedback to allow full understanding of the expectations. And as far as uh, dealing in civil protest, that was, a little, that was even more challenging, especially because of my background. Um, but what I did um, was to ensure that my team felt free to express their opinions while remaining professional and mindful that not everyone feels the same way about the issues. Uh, I dealt with that by encouraging individual uh, conversations with me at first. And then we did some group discussions, knowing that some of the emotions <clears throat> had already been filtered. Yeah. So it was easier to then come as a group and be able to hear each other on those issues. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Ms. Heather Roth? What counties does your office cover and what types of complaints does your office receive? I won't go through all the counties because we have 36, but I can if you want me to. Um, <laughs> but we're uh, pretty much the middle of the state. Um, we go um, really from Pittsburgh, uh, the edge of Pittsburgh to the edge of, of Philadelphia. Um, our office receives all types of complaints from employment to public accommodations to housing to education, um, and obviously the complaints are for a variety of reasons. Um, generally in a month, we will receive about 100 new complaints. 
So on average, between 1,000 and 1,200 new complaints come in every year. Wow, that keeps you busy, I'm sure. <laughs> Definitely. And Ms. Medley, same question. What counties does your office cover and what types of complaints does your office receive? Yes, um, we're the Philadelphia Regional Office and we cover a five county area of Chester, Bucks, Montgomery, Delaware, and Philadelphia County. Um, we get complaints, um, we get employment complaints, housing complaints, education, public accommodation, and a commercial property. Um, most of our complaints right now are coming from the Philadelphia area with Montgomery County second and Bucks County third. Um, most um, protected classes or uh, characteristics of the complainants, they're filing because of their race, mm -hmm. their sex, and also disability. Thank you so much. And Adrian Garcia, we know that housing is your expertise. Why has this become so important for you? And where does your passion for fair housing come from? I think uh, when I started in, in, in the human relations business, let's just call it that, uh, I started as an intake officer. Uh, on the employment side. And uh, because of my bilingual skills, I was able to help out on housing sides. Mm -hmm. What I saw uh, as an intake officer was that inevitably, the minute you lose your job, you're not that far from losing your home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was able to see that the first thing that people do when, they're, when their job's at risk is, is look for another job because you can always get another job. If you have skills, uh, and, and your background is decent, you're going to be able to get a job. Many times you're going to be able to get another job, maybe not paying the same thing. However, it's not true for homes. You lose your home and you have so many barriers to trying to find, cost being one of them. Uh, the minute you lose your home because you were evicted and may, may have been through no fault of your own, you are at the mercy of every landlord that is out there that brings every bad experience they've ever had into that new relationship. And you, with your trauma, are bringing the same kind of baggage. Um, I grew up in, in the northern center part of Puerto Rico uh, in a house where it was basically tongue and groove, and you can see outside. Um, you know, there was no interior bathroom. We, we used the latrine. Um, I had to cut wood for cooking. I had to go to the local communal spigot to collect water. Uh, I'm talking about 13, 14 years old here. And uh, so how, homing to me, and in my, in my house, my kids know, my home is my sanctuary. And I believe everyone deserves that sanctuary. And anytime someone wants to take that away from you, it's very personal because it doesn't only affect you, it affects your children. It affects your, pro, your, your prospects, your prospects for jobs, your prospects for education, your prospect, prospects for uh, uh, financial literacy. All of these things affect every community and every all of these aspects are important. This is why at the PHRC, since I've come there, we've developed this Fair Housing 360 mantra. We mm -hmm. must look at everything that affects housing and decide how we're going to address those things. We must work with local organizations like, uh, like Brittany Mellinger, I see her name there, uh, which is a FIP and some of the other FIPs across the state to ensure that we're all kind of in our part to, uh, to help these individuals maintain housing. And I'll stop there. That's one of those don't get me started questions, Professor Keys. <laughs> no, I, I love listening to you. And thank you for your level of consciousness and compassion. Um, I'm, I, I can see that you really put that into the work. So I honor that. Thank you very much. Um, and Mr. Lyle, what counties are covered by your office and what types of complaints does your office <coughs> Okay. Uh, in the uh, Pittsburgh, uh, for the Pittsburgh Regional Office, we have jurisdiction over 26 counties and the western third of the state, um, is, as far up as Erie in the north, uh, Washington County, Fayette County, Greene County in the south, um, as far east as, as Johnstown. Uh, and that comprises our area of operation and our, our jurisdiction. Uh, we also uh, uh, cover uh, cases that allege uh, lawful discrimination uh, in employment, housing, education, 
uh, public accommodations and, and commercial property uh, because of, of, of race, of gender, of uh, national origin, ancestry, uh, disability, age, familial status, uh, use of a guide uh, animal or sport association with the individual who uses uh, support or, or, or guide animal. So we have probably about 500, at least 506 current cases that we are investigating. Uh, a number, the majority of the cases we have are from Allegheny County, which is where Pittsburgh is located at. Uh, you know, followed probably by Westmoreland County, uh, Washington, and, and Washington County, and, and Fayette. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you. And Mr. Garcia, back to you. Um, our nation is experiencing tax attacks in fair housing. Um, we see that. We see that on the news every night. We, see, we read it in the newspaper every day, all of the attacks on fair housing. Can you tell us about some of those attacks? What are they? And what can be done from an advocacy standpoint to address <clears throat> some of those attacks? All right, sure. I'll try and keep it concise, but it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a pretty deep subject. Um, yeah. And we'll first start out with the most recent um, events regarding affirmatively furthering fair housing. The changes that have occurred to affirmatively furthering fair housing are akin to pouring gasoline on a smoldering ember uh, because it does ignite the feeling that I don't have to be so accountable to my actions as a municipality. In fact, the, the truth is that even under the old affirmatively furthering fair housing, we were basically depending on counties and cities and states to, to do this work. And what they were doing is basically, you know, assigning the specialty vouchers, the housing choice vouchers, the, the vouchers for veterans and so on and so forth. And that to them was a, accountability. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I would say that that old formula didn't work, but on the other hand, this new formula is a bit too broad. It leaves too much room for somebody to interpret it the way they want to interpret it. However, that being said, that also allows us on the enforcement end to interpret it broadly as well. And whether or not someone is actually doing what they're supposed to be doing to affirmatively furthering for housing. When you look at the definition that used to be, which was to take meaningful actions, right? That was the phrase, take meaningful actions. And now uh, it was uh, take meaningful actions in addition to combating discrimination. So it was an afterthought there. Now it's advancing fair housing within a program's participants control, which basically means if I as a municipality don't have control over this, there's nothing I can do about it. But you can do something. If you're a municipal official and you're on this call, you can do something actually. You can actually work with local community benefit organizations, social service ent entities, apply for funds from PHFA for eviction prevention uh, work, for landlord mitigation work. These are all programs that will allow you to help individuals maintain housing or find housing. The other thing is that we're, the other thing that we're seeing that is the other shoe that's going to drop is the disparate impact rule, which is also being considered, which basically makes the bar higher for complainants that actually want to bring a disparate impact uh, complaint against, say, a lender, right? Um, and so these are the, the things that are affecting fair housing uh, on a very real level. Uh, it is a bit of a, of a, a ro rollback, but we cannot allow ourselves to say, well, it's a rollback, I got to fight against it. There are ways to get within the, within the system to develop programs that actually are the workaround to some of these things that are happening. Those are two areas in particular that are affecting the, the housing right now. Thanks again. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure our listeners really appreciate all that you're sharing with us today. Um, Ms. Medley, Diana Medley, what are some of your leadership principles and how have you relayed them during these challenging times? Um, one is leading with compassion. Yeah. Um, this crisis that we're under has been mentally, emotionally, and physically draining. And um, I let my staff know that we're all going through the same thing during this time. And I also um, let them know that I know some days you're not just gonna be 100% because 
because there is too much going on. There's too much that you just don't know. And you're just not going to be 100%. And it's okay. It's okay. You're not going to stay there. We're going to help you move it on, but it's okay. Um, also, what I've been doing is empowering, empowering my staff, in particular, my team leaders or supervisors. I've been giving them the opportunity to manage and motivate their teams in their own way to accomplish the goals that we need to accomplish. And, you know, I wish they were on here because I would give them a shout out because I am just so very proud of how they have dedicated themselves to the staff to help with help us get this work done during this time. Also, um, one thing I've um, been doing is planning, learning, and, and, and with planning, I'm learning to be flexible because mm -hmm. each day stands on its own. Things change. They're not always going to go in order, so you have to be able to adapt. And um, I noticed um, during this time, um, that's what we've been doing. I mean, at first, when we started teleworking, we were working on one initiative, which was our intake. Come June the 1st, we're working on our investigations. So it took us a second to just be a little flexible to get on board with doing what we have to do to accomplish our goals. Also, um, during this time, it's, it's a sharing of skills and experience as we journey through this new norm. It's quite different. We could have never expected that we would be in a, um, uh, we would have this um, pandemic, but it's good to, um, during this time, share your experiences and learn from others um, in regards to the work. Thank you so much. Flexibility and sharing are definitely key. Thank you for that. Um, Heather Roth, same question. What are some of your leadership principles and how have you relayed them during these challenging times? Well, I've always thought that leadership is about people and not about me. Um, I have a, a lot of my team members on here today and um, it's really recognizing what people's strengths are and what things that they are good at and what they are able to do. Um, our team has uh, come together over this, this crisis and um, they've really uh, shown their skills, their passion, and their dedication for the work. Um, we've had folks emerge as leaders and we've utilized those folks um, to help us through this with the changes that we've had. Um, recognizing also not just the situation that we're in, but that it's affecting people differently. Um, we're at home, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later with the challenges, but um, not being able to physically see folks every day, um, we need to recognize that people have different um, circumstances that they're going in. Um, we also have folks that maybe have a little bit more of a learning curve. Um, so not everybody gets up to speed at the same amount of time. Um, not everybody has the same technology skills, which has been a challenge for some of us. Um, but just really focusing on the people, focusing on the team, um, focusing on giving people things that they're comfortable with doing, and then also pushing them a little bit out of their comfort level um, to try to challenge them to do more and to do better. Um, I really think that if anything good has come from us working from home and, and being part of this pandemic, I think we've all gotten more compassion for people. Mm -hmm. I also think that we have more compassion for ourselves as a team. Um, and we've become stronger, at least here in the Harrisburg office. Thank you. And I'm sure that everyone honors that compassion and appreciates that compassion. So thank you for sharing. And Mr. Wood, same exact question. What are some of your leadership principles and how have you relayed them during these challenging times? I'm sorry, I was muted. I'm okay. good now. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of things. I, I believe that uh, a lot emanates from, from me uh, and, and leading from the front uh, and being uh, an, an example uh, in many ways to uh, the staff that I have. Um, one of the uh, quotes that I have, I have a number of quotes in my office, one of them I have that really means a lot, uh, and this is from the uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, 
And it says the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but uh, where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Um, and, and basically, uh, you know, my demeanor, uh, you know, the, the way that I would tend to approach problems, the trust that I have in my staff um, to be able to make good decisions, uh, not micromanage every little thing that they do. Because, again, uh, uh, there's a, there is a learning curve uh, and there is a way to be able to help people and, and to be able to teach people because that's part of what I do uh, is that, uh, you know, is, is being able uh, to, to, to teach people, uh, to say, this is what you do in this circumstance. This is what I've found to be helpful for me uh, when uh, I've run into the same problem uh, or the same difficulty. Being accessible. Uh, there's never a time when someone cannot walk in my office, or now it's a little more difficult to do that, but there's never a time when um, someone cannot contact me on the phone, no matter what time uh, of, of day or what day it is. You know, I consider myself to be 24 seven with regards to my staff. Um, being cognizant of, of their fears, uh, being cognizant of, of, of w where they think their limitations lie and, and trying to elevate them uh, to the point where uh, they feel confident, uh, they feel as if they'll have the material uh, uh, support uh, uh, and, and backup from, from, from me as a director and from team leaders um, who, who also are there uh, and uh, within the chain of command to deal with them day to day. Uh, and and uh, not asking someone to do something that I wouldn't do myself or, or couldn't do myself. Um, I was, uh, it's funny, one of the things about being uh, at home uh, sometimes is you, you uh, unfortunately watch uh, more than you probably should. And, and I was watching a, a program the other day uh, and, uh, and this, this passage if, uh, for, for some of, uh, I know um, um, uh, Director Lasser is a very spiritual person, I'm sure everybody else, else is too, uh, that's from Isaiah. And it's like, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will be, uh, who go for, for us? And I said, here I am, send me, mm. send me. Mm. Uh, so there's not a situation where I would not go with them. And I've, I've done that where we've gone, even, even my mentors and my supervisors as, as a young investigator who would uh, see that I ran into a problem and say, come on, let's go. Uh, and, and would be right there. And I'd be in times of doubt uh, and fear uh, when I had kind of lapses in my confidence, I'd look up at them and I'd see how they would deal with it. And that just girded me uh, to be able to deal with, with anything that will come up. So as far as leadership style, uh, that's what I, what I try to do. Uh, and I have people, they're, they're free to speak their minds. Uh, it, this is a very stressful period of time. Uh, especially now, I, I try to, to, to talk to them as often as possible. Uh, I try to get into the office on when I know people may be in there just to say, how are you doing? Uh, do you need anything? Uh, and, and being with people a long time, you know, their families, you know, their children, you know, their significant others, you know, how are they doing? Do you need anything? Is there something else beyond this that I can do for you? You know, you never take anything from them, but you give them everything because they give you everything that they have to do their job. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So in times of controversy and challenge, you are right there for your staff and your team. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate that. And then finally with this question, Ms. Gerlaine Lerar, what, yes. <laughs> what are some of your leadership principles and how have you relayed them during these challenging times? Well, my biggest leadership principles are mutual respect, communication, and clear expectations. Basically, I try to t uh, treat my team the way I would want to be treated. And so I want my team to know that I respect them uh, and value them. And so before I make any decision that will affect the work that they do, I make sure that I get their input mm -hmm. and take time to evaluate if any adjustments to the work or to expectations need to be made. I also make sure I have a clear uh, understanding of the work that my employees do, as well as the time that it will take them to complete it. That way it prevents me from basically putting undue burden on them. Um, and when the work is completed, um, I give immediate feedback where I focus on their strengths and make suggestions about how they can perfect areas where their performance uh, maybe needs some work. 
And I try to look, um, I would say I try to look inward um, so that um, I can understand where my staff is coming from. I've been blessed with great employees who are committed to the mission and they're committed to the program. They've put in a lot of work to get this program off the ground. So I also wanna make sure that I'm there for them. And so given the already difficult times that we're dealing with, I don't wanna do anything to alienate my employees. Because I understand that uh, in the past few months, many people have been confronted with personal tragedies, whether they've shared them at work or not. So their tolerance to frustration might not be as high as it would have been in the past. So I want to be empathetic to my team at all times. Empathy is essential. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. So we're going to move back to uh, Mr. Wood, Mr. Lyle Wood. What has been the most challenging aspect of leading for you during this time, dealing with COVID-19 as well as the civil protests? How have you dealt with these challenges? The biggest thing is uh, just trying to keep everybody on, on an even string sometimes. And I think we're going into maybe our 24th week at the work, work from home. Uh, and, and it's difficult. It wears uh, on you. You're, you're pretty insular. You're cocooned uh, in, in your, your residence because we're all trying to uh, practice uh, safe interactions uh, and, and, and be as healthy as, as possible. Um, so it, make, it makes it kind of tough uh, to be able to not be there with your staff. I miss my staff. Um, they may not miss me, but I miss my staff um, in that, again, you get a pulse. Uh, you have your thumb on the pulse of, 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 the, of, of the office. You have your finger on the pulse of, of where they're coming from, you know, what difficulties they're having, what assistance that they need. Um, you know, when we first went out, that was back in March 16th, um, we had a uh, quick st staff meeting. Uh, people uh, grabbed their laptops, grabbed about two weeks worth of work, and we said, we'll be back in here on April 1st. Well, now it is August the 21st that we're still uh, not going in and probably will not be going back for the foreseeable future. So it's a matter of getting people so that they are comfortable uh, working. One of the things that we evaluate people on is being able to work independently. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, they're off on their own. It, it means that they can take the, the, the training and the skills uh, uh, that they have uh, and, and, uh, and uh, be able to do the work uh, that the Commonwealth requires a, a, us to do for the people of the Commonwealth. Um, to be able to say, hey, uh, let me just bounce this off of you. I have the trust in you and, and me have the trust in them that they will be able to, to execute and carry out you know, those functions that, that, that are necessary for us to enforce uh, and carry out the mission of the uh, Pennsylvania Human Relations you know, Commission. So that's been, that's been a little tough. Um, sometimes they may not, may not always understand, you know, why a decision is made and you do the best you can. So they understand and then they see uh, and that we're all together uh, in this. Uh, it's just not me. It's just not Director Lasseter. It's just not uh, the other regional directors, uh, uh, Director Garcia. It, it's all of us are in this together. We'll all be fine. We're going to come out together on the other end and we're going to be stronger. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily believe that if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, but uh, we're going to be better for, for this uh, at, at the end. I, I think uh, we'll continue to uh, uh, fight uh, hate in the Commonwealth and continue to fight uh, unlawful discrimination in the Commonwealth uh, for the benefit uh, and, and security of the people of the Commonwealth. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And Ms. Heather Ross, I want to ask you the same question. What has been the most challenging aspect of leading for you during these times, these challenging times with COVID-19 and the civil protest? And how have you dealt with this? Well, I think if you would have asked me this question in March, my answers would have been all around technology and, you know, trying to figure that out. But we quickly realized that that was really not um, our challenge at all. Um, our team, as I said, has been able to adapt and change very well. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I find is our, our Harrisburg Regional Office has a very close-knit team. Um, we gauge each other, you know, daily when we were, you know, working together in the office to see how everyone's morale was and, 
and to see how everyone's you know spirit was and their attitude and working from home it's been a challenge um you know we we, we conference call quite a lot and um you know we have phone calls but you really can't see each other um i don't know what's going on with the employees at home unless they tell me and i realize um with the civil unrest that we have right now everybody has different emotions um everybody has different connections to what's going on um we have to recognize i think as someone else said i think it was berlin that i have a staff of about 25 people right now and they may not all share the same political views um, they may not all have the same um, reaction to things that are going on, and we can't judge each other for, for those views or for those feelings. Um, I think we also, as leaders, have to be very conscious of our own presence, whether it be um, on calls like this or on social media. Um, we all have those outliers that are in our connection group that maybe not be so appropriate sometimes or might not share our views, um, and I think it's really important as a leader to make sure that um, we're setting the example um, for the rest of our employees and so that our employees and the people we serve are comfortable with us. So I think yeah. with everything going on um, and the, the situation that we're in, I think that's one of the biggest challenges um, for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Ms. Diana Medley, same question. What has been the most challenging aspect of leading for you during the pandemic and the civil protests? And how have you dealt with this? Yeah, I, I, I actually have a couple, but um, I'll start off with not having personal contact with staff. Um, you know, when we were in the office, um, you could just get up and, you know, just, just go and ask a question. Now it's this thing you have to, you have to email or even do a telephone call or do Skype in order to um, meet each other. Um, also, um, I try to make myself available for the staff. Um, a lot of times people are calling after hours and that's okay, but just make yourself, just try to make yourself available because we're all going through this. Also, um, I try to stay in contact with um, my colleagues who offer um, support and, you know, they can also be a sounding board for when you're going through. So I, you know, I'm thankful for that. I also, um, one thing that I've had challenges with is just staying optimistic. Um, there still are a lot of unknowns and we're all dealing with this new norm. And uh, my, but my new mantra is, um, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, you know, coming out of this situation, all of us will have a new perspective on work as well as life. Um, another challenge for me um, was getting used to working online. Um, we work with files. We have like physical case files that have papers in them, or I should call that evidence. And now we have to use an electronic file, which has all those items on there. But I was so used to having that file, that file in front of me and reading that file, that that has been definitely um, an adjustment for me. Also, um, the technology. Technology, um, I had to, at first when we started, um, we had our laptops and I was having connective issues as well as other staff members. But what I did to um, help that, um, I had to update my internet and um, it should have been done anyway, but because I have to work at home and I want to work, um, sufficiently work, get the work done, I had to um, update my internet. So those are some of the challenges that I have, but most of all has been not having contact with staff as well as keeping, um, just staying optimistic during this time. Yeah, and these are adjustments that all of us are having to make, but I love what you said about a new perspective on work. So thank you, thank you. And Ms. Gerlene Leroy, um, a different question. How have you been able to manage the demands of this moment? And what advice would you give other leaders on the balancing act of teleworking and family? Well, first of all, you have been saying my name absolutely beautifully. Oh, thank you. 
I just thought I would give you immediate feedback on that. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, Diana Medley said something that's so profound, uh, even though it's, we've heard it before, uh, but I, I constantly think about that, is that this too shall pass. So this really has been my mantra uh, in terms of helping me manage the demands of this moment. You know, this too shall pass. I, I really believe that, you know, the good passes before we're ready for it to pass, but it passes and the bad passes regardless. Yeah. So we just, uh, you know, I'm, I just believe that this is a moment that even though it's challenging, it has also brought us uh, a, lot of, a lot of joy. You know, some of us do uh, appreciate the opportunity that we've had to work from home. You know, that's a blessing in and of itself mm -hmm. that we are all able to, to keep our jobs yeah. and, and, and meet the demands of the time and of the positions that we're in. Not everyone uh, has been able to do that. A lot of people, in order for them to work, they've had to leave their homes and figure out what to do with their children or if they're taking care of a family member, they've had to, they have to uh, take care of issues that we're fortunate enough that we don't have to. Uh, so basically I've been trying to uh, see the glass as half full and not half empty. And so uh, in addition, I know you asked about what advice I would give leaders yes. um, on the balancing act of teleworking and family. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, if you asked me that question about four weeks ago, my answer would probably have been different mm -hmm. because I've had to, you know, you have to do more than going through things. You actually have to grow through things. Yeah, and, right. I be, and I believe that through the pandemic, I have grown not only as a leader, but also as a worker, because we all have, you know, um, demands as employees. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to, uh, to a leader or to other leaders is to make sure you set clear boundaries. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure you have a start time for your work and an end time for your work. In addition, have a spot in the house where you work and only work. <laughs> uh, I, didn't, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> so, um, and that made things difficult. And so if you have a spot in the house where you work and you only work, once you're done with work, you need to shut down your computer and leave that spot and go spend time with your family or, you know, if you do volunteer work, whatever else you enjoy that is not work, you should spend time doing that once um, you've completed your work. Uh, I used to be uh, constantly on, like I said, um, always ready to take a call, always ready to do work. And uh, some of my family members, especially my son, was complaining, they were complaining. And my son was complaining, like I had never had time to, I was never able to spend enough time with him. So now I'm mindful to make sure that once work is done, um, if I make plans with my family, I stick to them, yeah. you know? And so I would say, unless there is an emergency, uh, you know, if there's an emergency, you can go past uh, your time because you still have to be available to make sure that you take care of business. But as far as I'm concerned, it's not like I perform life-saving surgery. So <laughs> emergencies uh, would probably be very rare. Thank you so much. I love the difference between going through and growing through. Thank you, great advice. Thank you so much. And Ms. Diana Medley, Philadelphia County has experienced a surge in gun violence that has resulted in the deaths and physical attacks on Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. 
what can be done to combat this? Yes, um, gun violence is one of the biggest problems that the city of Philadelphia has. And the toll has been really heavy on the black community. I think I read somewhere where it said black men are 200 times more to be murdered and compared to their, their white counterparts. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we need to be progressive as well as aggressive in focusing on this issue. Sometimes it, it's just the bottom line is just, can't you put the guns down? Um, I believe it's gonna take a village and that village would consist of elected officials, police, the school district, community and faith-based faith groups to provide services to our young people. For example, the school district could incorporate conflict resolutions in student curriculum and provide more service to, to address the trauma that students experience on a daily basis. Faith-based groups and community organizations could provide mentoring programs, educational programs, and job skill programs for the youth. But this is something that we need to address because um, during this pandemic, there have been so many more murders, just unnecessary, young people just dying. And we all know that um, the guns, they're illegal. They're ir illegal guns that people are using to kill one another. Um, some um, the city, um, different organizations in the city would have this um, thing where you could bring in your guns and offer um, offer them a gift card or something. That really didn't work because we still have these guns out here and people are still doing the same thing. So at this point, I'm just saying we need, we really need to be progressive and aggressive and we need everybody's help in order to um, stop the violence in Philadelphia. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. And Ms. Gerline Lavore, um, where do we go from here with everything that we're talking about today? Where do we go from here? Um, well, it really will depend on which portion of America prevails. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the question is, will it be the portion of America that is fueled by hatred? Uh, for everyone who is considered the other, uh, whether it is based on race, gender, religion, or ability, or will the portion of America that is fueled by love, acceptance, mm -hmm. and a desire to see everyone thrive, yes. regardless of the specific attributes? So, and only time we will tell, but certainly at this juncture, we all have um, an opportunity to make a difference. You know, we all understand. Mm. We, we all understand what's happening now in terms of uh, there are elections, the elections that are on the, supposed to happen very soon. And there is work that we can do to ensure that the group that prevails is not the group that's going to try to hurt us. It's not the group that's gonna support for black men to continue to be killed. And that's gonna be a group that's supportive of black, the Black Lives Matter movement. It's gonna be a group that's against police brutality. It's gonna be a group that wants people to have fair housing. It's gonna be a group that's gonna want fairness and people to, or everyone to have the opportunity to be heard. So where do we go from here? We go to the polls and we vote for the right groups. I love that. I love and honor and respect the distinction between those who love and want the best for us and those who don't, as opposed to a distinction based on party affiliation, etc. So thank you for that wisdom. Thank you. And Mr. Garcia, back to you. Um, you do so much community outreach. What innovative ways can communities be reached during this pandemic? And, and that's interesting. You know, you would think that during this pandemic, because of the limited hours that many offices hold and everyone working from home, mm -hmm. that it would be mm -hmm. hard to, to, uh, 
to collaborate, but it's not. Everyone's home, everyone's on their computer. Mm -hmm. uh, so constant communication is, is key. Uh, any programs that any organization has and want to partner on, uh, on with other agencies, they should still be making those contacts. We're doing that here at the, at the PHRC. We're still reaching out and having meetings with uh, you know, Pennsylvania Real Estate Association and uh, the Department of Justice the other, the other week uh, with Lyle's uh, office. And uh, I'm still meeting with, with team members and developing events, uh, fair housing events and roundtables that we're gonna be having. So the constant motion uh, will keep, keep that outreach train going. But you know, the, the difficulty with this pandemic has been the isolation. And I know that many people feel that at home you're limited, but, but you're not. Once you get into this uh, frame of mind of being able to work from home and using the technology, getting uh, very good at Zoom and Skype and everything else that's out there in mm -hmm. Facebook Live, you can see that we've just found a new way to communicate, a new way to relate, a new way to communicate, a new way to get things across. Uh, and uh, for me, even as I left um, El Hop in, in Lancaster, you know, our activity level was a lot higher. It was a lot higher. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I came over to, to uh, PHRC and our activity is pretty high and getting higher by the day because it's purposeful. We need to be out there and being able to show people that this uh, enforcement agency, the leading civil rights enforcement agency in the state of Pennsylvania is active, it's motivated and moving forward. So I would say that any organizations out there need to keep their presence out there. And, and talk about their impacts and talk about the desires and remember the customer. That's the, the most important uh, person, the people that we're trying to reach, the people that we're trying to teach, the people that we are trying to defend and look after, that's our North because we are lucky and blessed beyond belief that we are still able to earn a paycheck doing what we love. And a lot of people are not in that position and that should motivate everyone in this position. You yeah. can't sit on your laurels at this point. You need to, especially at this time, especially with all the uncertainty and the protests and this high charged electrical, uh, uh, election season that we're in, you know, this is where you have to stand up and move that boulder forward. This is not where you rest. So that's, that's how I keep motivated. That's how I try and keep those around me motivated. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's really the, the way you promote that outreach. It starts with keeping your, yourself in the forefront, your organization in the forefront, your mission ahead of you and sharing that so that everybody gets energized with that and, and, and gets contaminated with that virus of, of progression. Thank you so much. Um, and I really respect and honor the emphasis on the positive, positive aspect of what we're all experiencing right now. Thank you. Mr. Lyle Wood, uh, you do a lot of community outreach. And so I just want to ask, why is that important? Why is that important to you? And also, what is the community saying at this moment? Okay. Uh, yeah, it is, it's, it's vital that we do. Uh, it's for us to be able to carry out the mission of, of the commission, for us to be able uh, to inform people of their rights, we have to continue to do that grassroots uh, kind of community uh, outreach. Um, I, I know that we do a lot of networking. I do a lot of networking uh, with, with people I knew before the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic hit. Um, and the one thing I always try to tell people is information is power. Uh, people, uh, if they have the information to be able to make good, solid decisions, uh, to be able to guide them in a positive direction, you have to get it to them. And one thing about being a director, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Heather and Diana uh, uh, and, and Adrian uh, would, uh, and uh, Gurleen would, would, would um, agree with, is that we get a lot of information from a lot of different sources. Uh, and it's incumbent upon us to be able to get that information to our, our, our community partners. Um, I know that when uh, usually I, I get something and they're probably sometimes I wonder, they have to be getting really tired of me because I shoot them that information, whether it's, it's updates on, on uh, 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 protocol for, for COVID, uh, whether it's something like uh, expungement programs that, that some of the uh, universities here run you know, to help our youth be able to have things removed from their, their records. 
uh, so that they can continue to, uh, to be able to be employed, to be able to, uh, to uh, receive, uh, uh, say, financial assistance when they go uh, to try to reach for higher education. Uh, to be able to, to uh, make themselves aware of apprenticeship programs that happens within our community, uh, you know, that is, is something that we have to do. Um, we have, like I said, a lot of information. We have a lot of contact. Uh, we've got to share that with our, 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 our partners. It, 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 it makes it just more challenging. It's not, I won't say necessarily more difficult, but more challenging to be able to reach out and to maintain those contacts. Uh, a lot of times I'll call people just to say, hey, how you doing? Uh, I don't have anything that I particularly want or, or, or uh, anything I particularly want to transmit to you other than I'm thinking about you, uh, we're concerned about you, uh, if you need something, we're here. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, uh, anything, you're, uh, we're here. People have to know what their rights are. We're all, you know, they have to know that there are certain things that are not going to be tolerated within the Commonwealth, that they have a right to live with free of discrimination, free of hate free of, of, of violence, and, and particularly in, in, in a situation where, you know, we're coming up on a couple of anniversaries here in, in Pittsburgh. Unfortunately, you talked about protests. Uh, we're coming up on the anniversary uh, of Antoine Rose, a young man who was uh, 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 shot and, and killed by uh, a police officer. Uh, we're coming up on uh, October 27th, Tree of Life. Uh, massacre that took place here. Uh, and there are a lot of disaffected groups within Pennsylvania. I think we're maybe the fourth or fifth highest in terms of hate groups uh, in, in the nation. Uh, you know, we get, and I get intelligence on different things uh, that well, I can inform people uh, that they can look out for, how, to, how they can better protect themselves, how they can better participate in this system uh, and not give up and, and, and not lose hope. Uh, you have to be involved, uh, you know, if you, uh, just like uh, the late John Lewis talked about, if you see something, say something. You just can't let it go. You have to be active because you may look at someone being abused one day and say, eh, that's not me. Uh, you know, Martin Niemöller probably said it a whole lot better than I, than I could, but be sure, rest assured, it's going to come around to you. You know, that train is never late, especially with us. That train is never late. It will be here. Uh, we have that, that responsibility uh, to be able uh, to serve uh, the community uh, and, and the public um, by giving, uh, empowering that community with that information so that they can uh, uh, go out and make good decisions, take advantage of different programs, especially right now. We're going to have a wave, um, I'm, I'm hoping we don't, but we're going to have a wave of evictions and foreclosures due to uh, people's unemployment uh, uh, connected to the uh, COVID pandemic. But if we can send them out information uh, about the CARES program where they can help get uh, rent paid or the Urban League of Pittsburgh that has a rent uh, uh, assistance program or, or the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency that does that uh, with, with rents and, and mortgages, um, then we're doing our outreach. Then we're doing, doing our, our due diligence in terms of, of, of the technical assistance that, that our act requires us to do with the community. Uh, and, and we make a better, stronger community uh, uh, as, as a whole. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. And then Ms. Roth, Heather Roth, final question. What advice would you give others as it relates to the balancing act of teleworking and family? Well, I guess I should say, uh, do as I say and not as I do because um, <laughs> I've not been very good at it so far. But, um, you know, the, the leaving work at work is easy, except when your work is at your home. So I, I've encouraged my staff, some of them that are on here now, and I, I won't call them out, but they need to leave and stop working when they're supposed to stop working. Um, we all have a tendency to want to do more and, and to do the best that we can, but we also need to look at ourselves and our, our own health and our own personal life as well. Um, Adrian, I'll, I'll give you credit. You had a great idea and I loved it. Um, if we have to do a, a 30 minute phone call to talk about something, let's go walk around the block on our cell phones and let's do a walk and talk. Um, take advantage of working from home. You know, take your 15 minute break with a cup of coffee on the porch and just get some fresh air. Um, use your commute time uh, that you're not commuting anymore to, to do something productive, whether it's exercise or spend more time with the family. Um, I just think it's super important that um, we do take time and, and we don't continue to just continue to work even though that we can. Um, the work is important, but our families and, and our personal health is also important. Um, I think um, as the longer we do it, I think we get better at trying to separate the two. 
um, but we all could use a little work with, with the balancing act. Um, so hopefully, again, as, as time goes on, we will get a little better, but I love the great ideas that everybody else has had you know, to incorporate things into our day. Um, being in front of a screen for eight hours and not having any human interaction um, is really taxing on folks. And I think it's super important, even during the workday, that we take a little bit of a break. So um, hopefully someone will have some good tips for me and maybe I can, I can take some of that, their advice as well. I like Orlean's idea too, work in one place and leave that place. Because um, I've gotten some of the same feedback from my daughter, like, why are you still working? Uh, you know, you're supposed to do this with me. And I've been guilty as well. So Marlene, I'm right with you. <laughs> <laughs> Those were all great tips. Thank you so much. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Director Lassiter. Yes, uh, I, I just want to commend the staff. Um, just I'm sitting here uh, choked up with a lot of emotions, uh, listening and learning uh, and being present. Uh, we're going to open it up to uh, Q&A, but I want to say uh, foundationally and fundamentally that the work that we do uh, is certainly not easy work. Uh, it's, it's very hard at times to divorce ourselves uh, from the reality. Um, each of the uh, members of senior management, and I would say members of uh, the PHRC, probably know someone that they can literally touch um, or could have touched who has died from uh, coronavirus or who was sick because of coronavirus, uh, whether that was someone that we knew in our families and or someone in our community, however we identify community. Uh, this work is daunting work. This work is, is challenging against the backdrop of a burdensome uh, and troublesome time. Um, and I think one of the things that we have to continue to do is renew um, our spirits. I heard a lot of how you all are coping at this time um, and it's wonderful. Um, and we have to check in with ourselves. This moment um, has left me despondent, dejected, depressed, uh, disheartened. Uh, and I'm not even talking about George Floyd. <laughs> I'm talking about 50 million people who had to apply for unemployment just last week. Um, on a macro level, there is so much that has gone into leading uh, the PHRC that we all get a check every other week and we're all still employed. Um, I think in the month of July, we received three checks. There's a lot of things that go into uh, all agency heads in the Commonwealth that are still trying to navigate this ship against the backdrop of $6 billion that have been lost uh, that we as leaders on this level really never get to convey. So we sleep with it, we, we meditate on it, uh, we toss and turn, sometimes we can't sleep. So I like what, 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 what Heather and Gerline said with regards to divorcing ourselves and being mindful um, of the fact that we need to take care of our families. Um, I think sometimes when you're in this position, you're in the position I see my colleague Corbett Anderson on here in the position of A.G. Shapiro, the, the position of Governor Wolf, the, you know, all of the secretaries, from Secretary Wetzel to Secretary Miller, Secretary Torres, uh, outgoing Secretary Pedro Rivera. We really don't be, we're not able to really divorce ourselves. It's, it's really, if it was eight days a week, it's eight. Um, but we have to be mindful of that. And uh, as we go to Q&A, I was mindful of this, uh, not my, my senior management doesn't, know this, or maybe a few know this, but I have a pre-existing uh, condition, uh, but even in the midst of the civil unrest, uh, based on our PHRA, I had to go out um, to monitor the civil unrest, and the condition is such that I can die at any moment um, if I would have been infected by COVID-19. So as a person who is, and, and, and a lot of family members were probably happy about that, like he has to die because they can get my life insurance. And maybe like Lyle always says, some of the staff might be like, yeah, he died, but oh well. <laughs> I know some people would miss me. Um, but, but the challenge is in the midst of all this, if you are a extrovert, who do you talk to in the morning? <laughs> you know, like I don't, I don't have children. I have, you know, nieces and great nieces and great nephews. Uh, but it's been very dis uh, distressing. Uh, I go into the Philadelphia office on Monday and Friday, and starting in September, I'll be going into Harrisburg at least uh, once a week uh, advocating for uh, this agency so that we can get uh, additional compliment. Proud of each and every single one of the senior managers, proud of everyone. Uh, this was not a mandatory event. So I, I saw Liz Corrales, Devin, I saw Ka uh, uh, Kelly, I saw Dana Prince, 
Uh, I saw Stephanie Chapman, multiple others. I saw Claire uh, Osborne, a, a dear colleague. I saw Beth, a dear colleague. So just an ending, very appreciative of all of those who tuned in today. Thankful for our moderator. Um, thank you, Layla. You and I, we just did one of these on Monday, reimagining re social justice, past, present, and future. So I'm Zoomed out, uh, but you know we renew, recharge, and replenish our spirits, uh, and we, we step right back in. Uh, grateful of uh, Tamika Hatcher, who's here, and Devin Price, and, and multiple others. They always say, don't get into naming uh, names because you might forget any, any, someone. So I just want to say thank you to everyone uh, and senior management, whatever way you need to to cope, uh, whether it's all of the suggestions you've given, uh, continue to do it. Uh, just know, like Heather stated, some of us are different. Uh, I work 24 hours, seven days a week um, on behalf of this commission, but you know that's, that's my calling. And so uh, let's open it up to Q&A. Uh, we had this for two hours. We certainly are at the two, uh, one hour mark. We don't have to stay to three o'clock. Um, it is Friday, it's beautiful. Uh, and maybe at some point after this, we can go out for that walk that Adrian talks about, uh, play with our, our dogs, our cats, whatever it is we need to do to cope in this moment, um, you know, we, we can do that on this Friday. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Layla, just for your sisterhood, uh, your friendship. Uh, I honor you in this space and I honor uh, my senior management team uh, as well as all the staff of the PHRC. So let's open it up to Q&A. And so if you have a question, everyone, um, I can actually see all of you at one time. So you can raise your hand this way, or you can go down to participants, click on your name and the word more, and then raise your hand. The hand raising function should be there. Is that the little orange thing? I'm looking for it now. It's, I'm sorry. So if you click on participants, you will see the words raise hand and you can click on raise hand and I will see your raise hand or because I can see all of you at the same time, you can just raise your hand. Okay. And I don't see any raised hands at this time. Oh, Thatcher, Thatcher. Okay. Yes, Thatcher. Could you unmute yourself? Sure. Thank you. So hi, Ms. dunbar -Keys. Hi, PHRC staff. Hi, yes, welcome to everyone. I just want to commend you all on doing um, a wonderful job. Layla, you did a great job with moderating and asking the questions. And each of our senior managers did a, um, did a really good job. I've kind of been narrating as you've been going along. I've been typing in <laughs> the, the salient points that you've been raising. So uh, let me see. So Adrian hit on something that's really relevant right now. He talked about the affirmatively fur furthering fair housing rules that are being currently decimated by the Trump administration. I saw on 27 News last night that Ben Carson was here talking about that, um, and I think in the city of Harrisburg at our um, housing authority people. And so it, it's really important that we keep our fingers on the pulse with that because we can anticipate that without that, those, um, even though it's a little bit uh, daunting for municipalities to keep that information when we don't have that, we can guarantee that we're going to see some uh, increased number of fair housing cases. So that is true. Uh, Gerlene, I believe you mentioned about having a greater level of compassion. And I think that that's really important too during this time. Um, Executive Director Lasseter talked about those of us who have been affected by COVID. And I've been one of those people. I've lost three family members during this crisis over the course of these couple of months. And so my, uh, I lost a grandmother well, my, my first cousin's grandmother, so she was Nana to all of us. So in, in the black community, if your cousin's got a grandmom, she's your grandmom too. And, and so raised all the days of my life with Nana. She was 91 and she lived in a nursing home and died of COVID. I had an uncle that was 68, died of COVID. I had a cousin that was 55 that was affected with COVID. And throughout, I had different levels of responsibility in, in responding to these deaths and the illness that affected my work and so i was grateful for the kind of flexibility that we had at home because uh i think i was doing uh we were doing a, a presentation with the philadelphia advisory council and i was talking to my advisory council members and i had family showing up to my house for a repast for a funeral repast so 
just having a little bit of grace and thankful that our employees have employers have given us that kind of grace or even when if we're not always as responsive i had an incident where i had um someone uh, write to executive director and say hey well i didn't hear back from tamika instead of him getting on he wrote back and just said what's going on and then i was able to say well i've had these other family situations this week and so grace is important so i, I appreciated that point that you raised let's see i'm looking at my notes because i was i was writing uh from all things that all of you said uh a point that heather made um it's while it's true that we do all have varying different political perspectives and we're on on different levels our, our role here as civil rights workers and as human rights professionals, uh, our, our act dictates that we eliminate unlawful discrimination in the Commonwealth. And so regardless of what people think or feel, it's kind of difficult for those of us who are having this lived experience in this George Floyd time, to not be able to see it and know that, well, that could have been me, that could have been my son, could have been my nephew, that kind of thing. And I guess for me and for so many of us, there is no gray area. There's no gray area in terms of civil rights. And so while our act doesn't distinctly cover all of those things, you know, police violence, okay, we can look at that if the governor calls us, but we are being called to more in this time. Police departments are contacting us and saying, we need you out here. We need you to be training us. Uh, employers are calling us all the time. You are getting calls from housing providers, other employers come in and train my HR staff because we don't know what to do. And so I think that there's an, we got to make that distinction that although people don't have hold the same political views, there is nothing gray about civil rights for all. And when we see things like what happened to George Floyd, like there's no, eh, well, maybe about that. So those are just the comments that I wanted to make. I thank you all. You did a phenomenal job. I, although it wasn't mandatory, I really wish that more of your staff members had been on here to see and hear what you're saying, because I think it's helpful to see leaders as people and when you're working under somebody it's easy to you know think that you sit up high and you look as low and you don't you know you're not very mindful of what's going on with them but i think that if more of them would have heard some of the things that you said they would understand that you're people with families and you have jobs and you have accountability as well too so thank you all you did a great job today thank you thank you so much mm -hmm. that thatcher that was heartfelt thank you is there anyone else with a question comment response yes my name is uh, reverend dr king and i'm actually part of the center county um advisory committee um so uh, i just want to say thank you for letting me listen in on all the work that you're you're doing and my background with uh with the pennsylvania human relations commission um if i can be real um I had a lawsuit back in uh, the 90s uh, for a hostile work environment. Um, and I worked with Ann Van Dyke. Uh, this is how <laughs> long ago, Jim Stewart, uh, Homer Floyd. Uh, and being a part of that uh, turned my, my work um, from that hostile work environment. I became an advocate and a community activist. Then I went back to school and got my doctorate um, to teach teachers because I was always um, working with education and students of color and discrimination and IEP compliance. And, and I'm still doing that. I did it for my children and now I'm doing it for my grandchildren in state college. Um, so what I'm saying is um, I've been around enough to see people come and go I've been around enough to see that the work that you do um, can be sometimes have consequences. Um, and I just want to say to all of you, you know, we're losing our elders, whether it's Elijah Cummings, whether it's mm -hmm. John Lewis, you know, everyone in, in the movement. And um, you're next um, to step up and do this work. And I know how it has an impact um, on you. The five years that I had to fight my lawsuit, it changed, it changed my life. Um, it was very stressful. And I just want to say I'm praying for you. I am so proud of you. I learned so much about leadership and, and just listening to you, but the resilience 
and that you're taking up this torch and it's just so much to bear. So I just want you to know I'm praying for you as essential workers. <laughs> Social justice is 24 seven essential work. Um, yeah. And I became a minister to take over an old AME church um, in Belfont. I'm under the tutelage of a 93 year old minister. Mm -hmm. And when the elders kept going, they kept saying, child, you're gonna have to step up. Um, so I did, and that changed my life. So we kind of have a divine assignment. Um, to do this work. And I just want to pray for you and put a covering over you, not just for COVID, but for the work that you're, you're doing. So God be with you. And there's so much work to do, but at least the young people are taken to the streets and helping us out. Um, so that being said, um, I just admire you all so much because this work is not, is not easy. Um, and you just, in, you just inspired me to continue to do the work of social justice that I do in this, in this community. Um, and just to, to say, I'm glad I'm still alive through it all. And I just want you to live through it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I, and I say, yeah, I say, I say, I say, I just, I want to, I want to say to, uh, Donna King that I really appreciate um, your comments, because I'm very aware that we all come to uh, the context of the work that we do at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission differently. And I've embraced that. There are, are some people who uh, they will eventually get it. There are some people they may do it in different ways. Uh, but I don't want to underscore anything that you said, because I'm a person that fundamentally believes that if you cannot get what you just gave uh, just now uh, from internal, you have to support yourself externally. Uh, yes. I, I heard everything that the staff said, but you're absolutely right when you position it that hate never takes a day off. Mm -hmm. um, neither can we. Mm -hmm. I also heard about what my staff said, which is sometimes I got to stay away from the phone or I got to do these things to engage. Yes. And that's real. That's why this title is challenging and complex. Yes. Um, but, but to your point, uh, we sometimes, we have the comfortable luxury to decide when we turn it off and turn it on. Yeah. And that's why I was trying to kind of transparent, not buying into my own victimization. I don't want folk following up with me afterward. You know, E.D. Lasseter, we didn't know that. But yeah, at any moment when I was out there for two consecutive weekends with my pre-existing condition, I could have died. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it goes back to what Martin Luther King said when he stated that longevity has its place or the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So there are a lot of things that, you know, each person has to decide how they're going to come into this space. Is it an intellectual exercise? Is it a nine to five? Uh, is it MI DNA? Uh, and any given week, uh, and Tamika knows this, uh, and so does Gurleen and, and all my senior managers, in any given week, you could be trending with dealing with uh, LGBT, transphobia and homophobia and then the, the following phone call you get is anti-semitism mm -hmm. and then after that you have another incident a police shooting and it's hard to capture that i mm -hmm. i spoke out and did a public statement on behalf of the pennsylvania human relations commission uh for the anti-semitic comments that a minister uh, rodney muhammad who's the president of the naacp here in philadelphia made I live in the same community as him. Three members of the Nation of Islam came to my house and they weren't coming with flowers. I had to share that with my bosses, which are the governor, is, uh, is the commissioners. I had to share that with the governor and my fiance was in the house saying, should we come back out the house? Or are we gonna be threatened? So you live in this, in this existence and it's not always trending on one side of the color line. Um, and so I just wanna just thank you because what you said is, is the way I trend. I get encouraged by people like you, uh, people like my dear colleague Claire and others who will send you an email, send you a text that you don't even know that well that will encourage you uh, in this moment. And I think if anything that we need to take from this uh, convening is that it's not just passion and compassion for the work we do, but compassion for one another. Uh, yes. the, the, to walk in love, truth, and kindness and recognize that however you may see someone that person is trying to do the best that they can do and to give people the benefit of the doubt. I recognize not every 
all 80 staff at PHRC are going to see the context of George Floyd in the same way that people who live in the black body see it. But I'm not ever seduced by race. There are white individuals in PHRC and elsewhere who are more incensed at the killing of unarmed yeah. black people than yes. some black people are. So we have to make yeah. sure that we give people the freedoms. Some people are coming into the awakening of their own. Look at what happened to Nick Cannon. Look what happened to Deshaun Jackson. They're coming into mm -hmm. a, a, an awakening, but just mm -hmm. in the wrong way with the anti-Semitism. So I think at the end of the day, what Donna King said is something that we should take. And I would encourage everyone in senior management to get those messages outside if you're not getting them inside. One of the challenges that we stated in senior management was we were on a call and we had no conversation around what happened to George Floyd because that is a curated environment that we had. Then when we went to a PHRC monthly commission, when folk were talking about the moment that they were in, people were kind of afraid to actually share the moment. And one of our senior managers said, I'm gonna put the racial elephant in the room. What we're talking about here is a resentment for black people in America. And when that senior manager said that, everyone else was like, oh wow, that provided some, some opportunities uh, but not everyone jumped in, and I was okay with that. Okay. And so, and so I think one of the unique things in ending is you stated it uh, so eloquently, Donna King, um, and I also respect people who don't see it, uh, see this as a calling. That's okay. But the reality is, while we have this moment as an agency, we should each and every single day be trying to explore ways that we're not going to allow anybody to put uh, a homophobic uh, comment or transphobic comment, excuse me, yes. on a menu trying to diss, you know, Secretary Levine, or they're not going to engage in homophobia, transphobia, mm -hmm. or any form mm -hmm. of racism. And then as mm -hmm. African Americans, I'm not speaking for PHRC, I'm speaking for Chad Dion Lassiter. I cannot operate and I don't operate in trying to make our white colleagues, workers, family members feel guilty with white guilt. I, I just don't do that, right? I really believe that there are enough white individuals out here fighting the same fight that I'm fighting. And Allies. this moment that Donna King, you spoke about, shows that globally. There's a lot of white folks who are saying Black Lives Matter, not dis dismissing any other lives. They're just saying that we're focused on these lives at this particular point in time. So we can't get seduced uh, by race at PHRC. We can't get seduced by race outside of PHRC. Um, and I just want to say, uh, uh, Donna King, feel free to, uh, I'll put it in the chat, Tamika, whoever can put it, put my email in the chat. Um, I would love to learn at your footsteps because you're right. You know, Maxine Waters may be tomorrow. Nancy Pelosi may be tomorrow. Longevity has its place. But while we're here in these bodies, we need to do the things that we need to do. Uh, and because I'm African-American, I'm not just doing them for African-American uh, folk. I'm doing them for all folk. For all folk. That, that, that's where we get the whole term human family. Hue. We're all a different hue, but we're all part of the, uh, um, uh, you know, family of, of, of existence. And I just want to just tell you, I'm so choked up with what you said because uh, you're an older woman um, who's still out here fighting. And the, the hope is that we can have longevity in our lives to fight as well, whether we're at the PHRC or just in our home, making sure our homes don't don't engage in any form of ism, making sure that we don't uh, engage in any form of ism or that we let a joke uh, go unattended uh, when someone makes a joke at our Jewish colleague and because their last name is not Kaplan, Lippmann, Stein, or, or Berkowitz, uh, that we, we're okay with that. So I, I'm sorry for prolonging this, but I just want to thank you uh, and honor you for coming in this space and saying what you said. Um, if, if there are, I see there are some other hands, we can take those hands. Yes, um, I see. Thatcher, did you want to follow up with what you said earlier? Um, oh, no, I, I would just say, I'm going to go back off of mute, but the only thing I want to just say is that if we can't have these types of conversations here, we can't have them anywhere. Like if PHRC staff and employees are not having a civil discourse on what's going on in our society, how can we get to the work in the cases and go out and, and find probable cause of discrimination or be able to give a fair look at when there is no cause because there are instances when there is no cause, but to be able to get to it, we've got to be able to bounce this off of each other and have these kinds of sometimes painful conversations, maybe disagreement and be able to come to, um, you know, just an understanding about the work it is that we're, we're doing. So um, again, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you again. Um, I see Devin Price. 
Good afternoon. Um, thank you for um, inviting us to this. Um, I think it's very important that to this, um, demonstrate the strong leadership that we do have um, at PHRC. Um, a couple things. Um, mine is more of a comment, not a question, but I wanted I to say yes to I want to see your face, Devin. Okay, well, then you're going to see me reading, too. Is that I'm not question? dressed. I'm working from home. <laughs> yes, sir. Carlene, could you mute yourself? I just wanted to say yes to uh, Mr. Garcia. It is a blessing to have the opportunity. Carlene, could you work? It is. We're having Can some difficulties. Can y'all hear me? With feedback, but Devin, go right ahead. Can y'all hear me? Uh, you have. We're having some problem with your volume. I think I lost power. Can okay. Yes, Mr. Garcia, it is a blessing to show you. Yeah, I, I I don't know what to say. Can you hear me? Yeah, but it's going in and out, unfortunately. Can you hear me? Okay, he just he just sent us something that said go on without him. Okay. Yes, and Devin, if you want to put what you your comment in the chat, also that'll be a good idea. So we're going to go to Beth. Yeah, I think um, I have a lot of internet usage here in house. So we're going to move on to Devin. I mean, I'm sorry. We're going to move on to Beth Agioli, Andreoli. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you for letting me be part of this today. Um, so some of you may know me. Um, I'm with the Office of Performance of Excellence with the governor's office doing the LEAN initiative. Um, but one thing that I've really taken part of with LEAN is we, we talk about empowerment of employees. And you've touched on that a bunch um, throughout this conversation. So thank you for that. Um, so we're talking about having a more human-centered type government, not only looking at the customers, but also internal um, employees and, and making sure that they feel empowered and they have a, a safe workplace. Um, so initially we had talked about, you know, in our office about empowering employees, but what does that look like? But, you know, with all the, you know, civil unrest and other things like that happening, I feel like it's important to start having more of the tougher conversations. Um, so I've kind of started going down different paths with that. I'm starting up a group in, in my office to try to start um, reviewing some information about diversity and inclusion and that kind of thing. So I'm just kind of, I guess, using this as a plea to see how I can possibly partner with uh, my friends at PHRC um, to make this as impactful um, and effective um, to really do some human-centered work in the Commonwealth. So I'm just kind of throwing it out there as a plea for help um, and seeing who can help me um, kind of figure out a, a good way to start this um, and continue on the work. Yeah, let's, let's get a meeting, Beth, you, Claire, and myself um, next week. Um, I think some of the work so that we're not duplicating efforts uh, the governor has put together a racial equity holistic approach by looking at each uh, department and has various buckets. So education, transportation, human services, uh, so forth and so on. And it, there's a working document that we've been working on. Um, and then you, Claire, and myself can talk about some best practices. I think the thing to note is that the conversations are, are very uncomfortable and they're very difficult. I think what oftentimes does not get articulated um, from African Americans is that they're also difficult for us. Um, difficult for us because oftentimes we're placed in a position where folk want us to give uh, advice on how to solve it. Um, for me, it's twofold. I don't like having the conversation. I don't like having the conversation because it brings up too many uh, scars. It activates a form of vicarious traumatization. And then I also see the complexities in the conversation. Uh, and one quick example is I, I'll see the complexity of how 
uh, some African Americans in my community may use the N word. And then when one of my white colleagues use the N word, my African American friends want to come down hard on them. And I understand it on both sides. I understand it on both sides. I, you know, Layla and I, we, we're both from Philadelphia. We've seen how uh, a white cop has been killed by a black person. Uh, and there's no, uh, there's a lot of rallying. But when a black person has killed a white cop, uh, there's conversations. Uh, but what, what the white community doesn't know is that no one comes to our community to hear that we're really incensed by it as well, because we see the humanity. And so, you know, I, I think there's some things that we can do. I'm going to give you and and Claire, a document that we put together uh, in the governor's office. And for those of you on the call, uh, the governor has called together um, everyone that is ahead of uh, a cabinet a position. Uh, and we've been working on one, telling our stories, right? And so you'll hear a person talk about how they're in an interracial marriage. And we're just like, oh my God. Um, but not, oh my God, in that sense, but it's just because we do so much working, uh, folk don't even know about these conversations. They don't know that someone may have been brutalized by the police or someone may have been stopped. And even though you may have secretary in front of your name or executive director, that you're still not absent and void of, uh, of police misconduct. So we'll get a meeting, Beth, uh, with you, Claire, and myself, and, and share some, some best practices. And then we have some materials uh, that we've put together at PHRC uh, that's on our website that we'll share with you as well. Thank you, Beth. So, Gerlene, is your hand still up? Or we just didn't put your hand down? Did you have a question, Gerlene? That was answered. OK. <laughs> Thank you. So does anyone else have anything before we convene for today? One last comment uh, on the housing front and, and we touched upon it earlier regarding affirmatively furthering for housing. We need to walk away from here knowing that it's everybody's responsibility to affirmatively further fair housing. The fair housing was not known as the fair housing law. It's known as the fair housing act and affirmatively furthering fair housing is how we act as a community. So programs that, that bring together programs that will um, eliminate barriers to housing that are being put together in partnership between municipalities and community benefit organizations uh, that allow for people to attain housing, that's affirmatively furthering fair housing. First time home buyer programs, that's affirmatively furthering fair housing. The more we can support those programs, those will be our workaround. And we cannot sit around waiting for the government to put in a couple of words into a rule that made no difference before makes even less difference now. If we want to see that difference, we need to be the ones putting the difference in and we need to go to those meetings and we need to encourage community organizations to come together and seek out the funding that will allow them to do the work. Let's not wait around for the government to do it for us. That's my final word. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Leila. Thank you so much, senior management. Thank you so much for those PHRC staff members that uh, took of your time to tune into this. And thank you for just the larger community as well. Uh, everyone enjoy your weekend. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Levine always encourages us, make sure that you mask. Make sure that you mask. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leila. Thank, thank you, Chad. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. Have a great day. Thank you, Leila. Great job. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.